The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Bashir Fancy, and on behalf of KIPS, uh, Canada, Ontario, Canadian uh, Information Processing Society, for those who are not familiar, um, we're very pleased to host this event tonight, and very fortunate that we have Sean Slack, the Chief Information Officer for the City of Mississauga, who's going to actually walk you through and talk to you about the smart city technologies, basically, exactly how they're deploying that and through the Internet of Things. And it's very interesting, and you will really uh, enjoy, enjoy. And, and hopefully if you have questions, you will ask them. So Sean, as I mentioned, is the Director of Information Technology for the City of Mississauga and the CIO. Early in his career uh, with the City of Mississauga, he led the vision and a plan in order to provide city services online. He also oversaw the implementation of the city, uh, of implementation of the city's first uh, customer service strategy, which was transformed into customer services across all channels, including internet, phone, uh, counters, as well as the implementation of 311. Those who are familiar with, uh, I believe even Toronto may be doing that now. But it's basically one number, and you get services for everything. Uh, currently, Sean is engaged in many great initiatives and projects guided by the new IT master plan, uh, endorsed by the City uh, Council, basically, in 2015, which focuses on, which focuses on fostering open and accessible government, enabling decisions uh, through research and analytics, uh, creating a connected and engaged workplace, and, and certainly improving services uh, through um, innovation. So um, those, who those who live in Mississauga, as I said, would have seen all those uh, wonderful things already happening. Um, as far as uh, the rest is concerned, you're going to see uh, Sean in action tell you all this. So I'm not going to waste much time and, and hand over to Sean, and thank you very much for doing this. I truly appreciate that. Um, so stay tuned if you have questions we have from the assigned who will be monitoring at all times and will be happy to answer your questions. So thank you very much and Sean, welcome. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Basher, for the uh, introduction. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to mention that we've uh, had a major incident in Mississauga today with a, a few houses that were involved in an explosion. And I just wanted to say on behalf of the city, you know, hard to go out to the families affected and that um, there's an appropriate response in place to help people get lives back in order. Okay. So this presentation is to give an overview of what the city of Mississauga is doing. Uh, the context is smart city technology, and but uh, the presentation really does look at the fact that that hasn't been our driving force. It's uh, the marketing terms and industry uh, that framed up those. So, just trying to get the next screen. Okay. So first, a little bit about uh, the state of Mississauga, short video, just to really give you an overview uh, of really the, what's the uh, strategic plan is behind the city. Yeah. So it should be. All right. 
So I'm going to skip over that. We'll and uh, we can always come back to that. See if you're good lady. Okay. Sure. So um, a little bit about uh, what a smart city is. It's interesting. There's all sorts of uh, commentary and documentation, but it's interesting. This article says Wikipedia, which is a crowdsourcing of opinion, uh, just says that it may be confusing or unclear to readers. And so this really is sort of where smart cities are at is a lot of different cities are talking about technology, but they're not quite sure how it equates to what smart cities and, and what smart cities mean. Uh, another interesting article, uh, due to the breadth of technologies that have been implemented under the smart city uh, label, is that a, a precise definition these aren't really available, so so it's interesting. Yeah, and another uh, definition. The smart city sector is still in the I know it when I see it phase. <laughs> <laughs> So I had the opportunity to meet with leaders from around the world, in Brazil and China, and everyone has a story to tell. And they say, I guess that means we're a smart city. <laughs> and so, uh, so you can see that it's an evolving terminology in industry. And, and that actually is why in Mississauga, we, we never said we're going to be a smart city. We just said we were going to use technology to enable services. So help to mystify this a bit. Uh, what's a smart city? It's really one that connects services to, to make it more efficient, for a better customer service, uh, and, and connect light services. All right. Okay. So, so uh, it's interesting. Back in 2008, IBM had said it, it had come up with this concept of smart cities, and I thought it was only appropriate to uh, show that the city of Mississauga did this back in 2006. <laughs> so. We, we have these things called technology days, and uh, our, our, our theme was Smart City, and just to prove it, Mississauga Tech Day, 2006, March 8th, so, <laughs> so we were even ahead of IBM. There you go. <laughs> anyway, so the, the term has been around for a while, uh, but perfecting the use of smart technology uh, is still on the way. So, for us, it comes down to infrastructure. <coughs> and the the uh, public sector network you can see on the screen here is a, a private fiber network. And this is owned within a regional field. And it's, um, sure. it's a shared partnership between Peel, Brampton, Mississauga, and Calhoun. So we have about 630 uh, kilometers of private fiber and about 40,000 strand kilometers, which is enough to serve the plant once. So this is the foundation of smart city. This is how we're able to connect things. You use your fiber network and extend that with wireless, Wi-Fi, and, and supplement that with cellular as well and other technologies. So what's driving this is really what the public expects. So connectivity everywhere. So it, it's interesting, our kids take for granted that Wi-Fi will be available no matter where they are. And, and so we, a few years ago actually, came up with the Wi-Fi zone in the middle. And, and we have free public Wi-Fi in all the same facilities. Libraries, community centers, marinas, arenas, and it really has become a public service. 
and is actually a key measure in my business plan and budget is the utilization of that. It's a consumed service. So we all know that power is the great equalizer, but according to Maslow, he's updated the basic human need and now Mike. Hello, hello, hello. I'm back now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, we've had a bit of a sound issue, and I think we're back on track now. Apologize for the uh, for that. Um, I, I'd left off probably um, on the previous slide, so you probably didn't hear this. Just just in a recap, uh, these are different uh, examples of of um, smart um, city technologies, as in the next bus sign, which is part of a, a large-scale uh, new transit way station uh, that is fully automated. It's an unmanned station, so all of the technologies um, within that facility are running on our fiber backbone. Uh, bottom left was the, um, the um, waterway measurement, which we use for escalation of flooding, which drives an automated response uh, for our operations all the way up through, including a level three response, which would be our emergency operations center. Uh, and then some other technologies such as pay and display uh, and traffic uh, counting on the highways, which we actually utilize that technology. So we uh, take that feed of data um, into our traffic management system. So if there is ever an accident on the highway and they have to divert traffic into Mississauga, we know the volumes. So I'm back to needing to do page down here. Yes. All right. Got it. Uh, so the Internet of Everything, okay, so another terminology out there, marketing term. Uh, so Internet of Things um, is more the, the basic term. Internet of Everything is a Cisco term. Really what they're trying to say is the rate of things connecting is exponential. Um, those things um, need to be monitored. They need to be managed. They generate data. And, and my, I think for me the biggest opportunity for any municipal government um, is these things create situational awareness. And so the more things connected that generate sensor information, whether it's environmental, operational, heat, variables, these things can be used to monitor situations. And then on aggregate, you can start to look at trends. So consider, you know, if everything in the city that could be connected was connected and you monitored that for several weeks under normal conditions, you would understand what situational, what normal looks like. And then over time, you'll see variations. And those variations is where you learn, you know, sort of the cause and effect on your, on your system. So uh, I, the best example I can think of is if you set up your traffic systems to say, here is what rush hour traffic looks like. And you can monitor based on the movement of vehicles what that looks like and manage your traffic light systems to that. But if at one in the afternoon, when it's not rush hour, all of a sudden the traffic volume starts to feel like rush hour because there's a closure on the highway. You can actually train your system to say, if this feels like rush hour, modify the patterns to be rush hour. And that really, to me, is sort of the advanced way of how um, connected things could you know, drive value and, and be more responsive under basic conditions. So in the city of Mississauga, we, uh, we have a city strategic plan, and the video that I was going to show up front really did tell a bit of the story. It's a 40-year strategic plan. It talks about um, a modern corporation, a modern city, and it's about inspiring possibilities um, and really is what's driving you know, the redevelopment of downtown, uh, the redevelopment of the waterfront. We've got a new light rail transit going up to here, Ontario, that's about to be built. Um, the city of Mississauga is really changing. And so because of that, we've had a series of other IT strategic plans, but the IT master plan really was a process we went through uh, to really get better alignment with the business um, and with really where the city needed to go. And so this was a process that was undertaken um, engaging the community, key, st key stakeholders internally, as well as industry leaders. And I'll talk a bit about the industry leaders. But uh, we created four strategic um, themes, and the first one being, and I mentioned, I mentioned this up front, fostering open and accessible government. So that's about online services, open data. We just held a big hackathon here back in March, an open international open data day. Um, it really is about engagement within community and using different you know, public engagement tools um, 
um, to deliver services online. Uh, enabling decisions to research and analytics, this is about accessing that data. So now you're collecting all this information and all this, these new connected things um, and being able to use that information to make better decisions. <clears throat> I can give you two real quick examples how we do that today. Um, one is in transit. Transit, we're right in the process of implementing the Presto Card system. The historical system is selling transit fare media, which is the paper ticket, the cards. Um, and it's quite quite a complex situation because as you convert, um, you have the uh, agents, which are typically variety stores that rely on that foot traffic to buy the, the transit fare because you're going to get your chocolate bar and, and pop too. And so the issue is when their sales dip below 100000 we have to take away the agent license, which is controversial. And so what we're doing is using mapping and real data to show the conversion and the, and the drop of sales so we can stand behind our decision when we're in front of our elected officials and say, here's what's happening. The end goal is to convert it all. The difficult part is when you start closing down these agent sales locations. And so that just gives us the ability to stand behind our decisions to use real analytics. So that's one example. The other example is in recreation where um, our ability to recover our costs for recreations or cost recovery rate. So if a swim, um, if we charge $50 for a swim, we want our cost recovery rate, so our expenses to deliver that to be recovered as high as we can. And so the challenge with recreation is you have high variable expenses, part-time staff in a very large city. Um, and high variable revenues because even if we want to advertise 100 open spots, you don't always get 100. So we have a dashboard that actually measures uh, participation on programs and the expenses associated with the participation, so staff. And then we look at how many people go in. And if you find two locations that are half full, we'll make the decision to move people over. So basically you took the revenue of two locations and put it in one and use just the expense of one location. So we're able to get a higher recovery rate. So that is not a lagging metric. That's actually real-time planning um, to reduce our costs. The, um, the create a connect and engage workplace really is where our big play on, you can say, smart city technology. Um, this is us connecting our services and connecting our workforce uh, so that we can work anywhere, uh, so that we can also um, take the benefit of connecting our environment and getting that bigger picture of the situational awareness. The final, final pillar around uh, improved services through innovation and partnerships was really something that came out of the process we went through. Because we engaged with the vendor community and, and with key stakeholders, you know, including you know, Sheridan, uh, University of Toronto, Mississauga, um, we found that they all wanted to partner. And what we quickly learned is that innovation and partnerships reduces risk. So, so we, if you take smaller initiatives, partner, partners can shoulder the risk, you, you can actually be more innovative. You, you can try things, and if they don't work out, the, the risk and the scale of those things is much smaller. So, um, so there are real benefit through uh, innovation and partnerships. So when we went through the master plan process, um, we got all of our internal stakeholders, you know, from all the different divisions and departments, so the transit, recreation, parks. We actually took them to the headquarters of these companies, and there was a few more. So we went down to the Apple Executive Briefing Center in downtown Toronto, and we had people from the various departments, and we sat down with Apple and said, tell us your story. Where are you going in the next three years? Because the consumer's in charge. So if you guys are planning for something, we know that's going to have an impact on our services. And they did two things. They said, number one, we've never ever seen anyone in the public service do anything like this. So thanks for coming. Um, they shared all sorts of interesting things and something that and there was a conversation around the table early. So heads up technology was something we talked a lot about. Um, and, and really at first you think, okay, so what does that really mean? So uh, interesting is that not too uh, long after that we were looking at fire technology which had RFID and the capabilities of heads up technology in visors. So where you could have display information on the visor um, of a fireman's helmet. So these types of technologies are available. It's just finding that business application. We spent time with Microsoft, SAP, Cisco, Bell, LinkedIn, Infor, and did the same process. Tell us your story because whatever's happening with you in the next three years is going to, to be an important thing for us to understand. And so we used all that information 
And we also went out to some of the best cities around the world and asked them what they were doing, what their best practices were, and, we, and that's where really we came up with those four key strategies. Um, the idea of the proof of concept, and this is something that, um, this is about, you know, taking on some risk. So when proof of concept is, is really just saying, look, we're not too sure this thing's going to work, and we're actually pretty transparent about that. And that really is this ready, fire, aim concept. And, and this is where partnerships, uh, where you want to bring someone who actually is bringing some to the table that is fairly in, in like in an R&D phase itself. So they actually, they're looking for a platform to test some technology too. So the idea of a proof of concept is part of us being able to try new technology and understand its application in our services um, allows us to take on some risk. So um, from a create a connected and engaged workplace, that whole uh, strategy, um, it really was about you know taking that IT infrastructure, the fiber, um, and looking at how it's become essential to city services. So you know it's been 20 years since we first started building our fiber, um, and in our partnership through the public sector network, um, it's been pretty interesting to watch that um, is is we didn't build fiber. Um, you know, as a plan to build fiber. We always build fiber to link services. So I would say for the last 15 years, a fire station is going to be built, we plan and build fiber. A recreation center is going to be built, we plan and build fiber. But for the last couple of years, we've actually looked at it more holistically. And we've said, look, what services are going in in the north quadrant of the city? And we look at signs, traffic signals, watering stations, all these things that connect. And then on aggregate, we build all those together. And we've been able to reduce our cost of building our fiber because we plan holistically. So instead of doing single build and design for a facility, we look at here's the 35 things that we absolutely must connect in the next 10 years, and we do the design and build, and we even partner. So we're partnering with, with uh, other communications providers and getting in their construction. So if we're reconstructing a road, we'll put conduit in the, in the road um, so that in the future we can run our fiber. So one of the uh, key initiatives is this uh, concept of designing and building a smart city framework. As soon as this was approved, we appointed uh, a, a new uh, project manager um, in charge of building the Internet of Things network. And, and this person, um, his full-time job is to deal with all the services across the city, all of the construction going on in the city, and coordinating fiber build and optimizing our infrastructure based on other construction work. And what we're seeing is an exponential payback in this whole coordinated effort as opposed to the old way, which was a single purpose build network. And uh, the other thing we've been able to do is to actually demonstrate this to the senior leadership of the corporation and show the value of the fiber. In the past, the value of the fiber has been voice and communications. And it's, it seems it's so it's fairly limited, although that voice and communications benefit equals just over $2 million a year in not having to lease lines. And so we'll have a major facility, like a major community center, and you think of all the services, and all we have is two telephone lines going in, and that's for 911 and, and location services for, for the emergency responders. The rest of the building is running over our fiber. And we back, hello, hello, okay, we're back. Can you hear me? We're back. Sorry, we've had. Uh, um, I'm probably talking too much. <laughs> All right. Let's. <laughs> so, so, um, so I was talking about the AVL. So, so um, we use AVL and Wi-Fi in conjunction. Um, I don't know if I need to go page up or page down, which I can't get back to. Yeah, yeah. Okay, page up. Um, so just to, just to try to, to finish this up, so pylon signs, we use that to drive messaging out in real time or local messaging for the community centers or libraries or wherever that is. The BRT stations, again, these are major unmanned uh, stations uh, for higher order transit. Um, all of our works um, and community center vehicles uh, have GPS tracking. Matter of fact, the, um, our snow fleet, there's actually a, a roads app. So the snow fleet, you can go online and see where your snow plow is now. We put a bit of a delay on that so you can't go out and, 
and you know, attack the snow plant, uh, the snow uh, plow driver. Um, but it tells you the level of service in your road. The last time it was a plow, and where that plow is right now. Um, and then we have our building automation network as well, um, which. Um, is, is critical with the, with the number of buildings we have today. We have to centrally manage uh, HVAC and all of our facilities. And at the bottom, and I, I can barely see it on here, but it's actually pretty significant. We have 50,000 LED street lights that are all connected. Uh, um, and those are actually, it's a, it's, it's a hosted solution. And actually, all of the data goes down in the US, it's in, in Houston. But we are actually able to turn a light on and off we're able to do the light treatment. So we have the capability to go to an intersection where we want to improve safety with lighting. We can actually turn the lights up in the intersection. In other areas, we can turn it down where maybe we, there's complaints because the, the lighting is too intense. So when we look at our district Wi-Fi project, we're actually going to be demonstrating what we can do with LED, LED lights. But the immediate payback and benefit was in millions of dollars in electricity. The actual automation piece was a side benefit. Um, but there's all sorts of other sensor technologies that you can connect to these LED lights and the radio systems associated with LED lights allow us to transmit that back. There's 50,000 LED street lights and about 300 controllers. So a group of lights on a radio network would come back to a controller, that controller then back calls back through, um, well, I think it actually goes back over the internet back to Houston at that point. So this is what it looks like from a city of Mississauga perspective. This is, uh, you know, the map of all of the future uh, and current growth. Uh, we have a two-year construction contract. That's what we're doing in IT. We're doing construction work. We're, we're, we're um, digging up roads and, and, and putting in conduit and fiber and connecting trucks and lights, sensors, um, and, uh, and we're seeing a significant benefit. So some of our key projects, so advanced traffic management, the, the picture on the right is uh, our advanced traffic management center. It's a brand new uh, facility. Um, this is where you get your situational awareness. It shows um, all of the uh, traffic cameras, um, and it shows the activity going on um, during rush hour and so on. This system is just being put in place, the core system. So over the next two years, we're continuing to build out and bring our traffic intersections online. We'll have a balance of these intersections done on directly connected over the Wi-Fi or cellular, and again, using an APN to backhaul that. We have our uh, bus rapid uh, transit way, which is uh, and Metrolinks Go My Way stations will continue to get built out, and we have the LRT, Light Rail Transit, which is um, putting Light Rail Transit up here in Ontario, and I'll go into detail on that. Detail on that. And finally, district Wi-Fi, which I mentioned earlier. So advanced traffic management, at the core of all this, you've got your traffic management center. So this is where you have a team who are monitoring what's going on out there, the situation. Um, and then around that, you have some basic traffic technologies that you can use to you know, make improvements to traffic flow. Um, SCADA systems, you know, um, you've got your input from um, people you know, pushing the, the button, say, I want to walk now. So these are interrupting typical cycles and being able to respond to that. And then on the outside perimeter, you start to get into the higher levels of, in, uh, of integration. So how do I advance fire truck? So this is this uh, preemption. How do I get a fire truck through an intersection faster? How do I get a bus through faster? How do I get a uh, snow plow through faster? Um, and, and this is the other thing where you can get uh, traffic information from highways so that you can get a better understanding of the traffic before it comes into your system. Um, you can get that information directly from the MTO. So these are what we call more the advanced side is being able to better manage these other services. So what are we doing for this is uh, we're building fiber nodes. Um, that's our outdoor communications network. Uh, we're building a wireless infrastructure, so that's taking where we think it's not cost effective to put fiber, then we continue with, with wireless, so we can Wi-Fi access points, um, either point-to-point -point or mesh. Um, and really the other spot is, is where it's just not practical is we use Rogers and APN. <clears throat> and uh, the picture on the right, it says zombie invasion run. Uh, that's uh, from St. John's, Newfoundland. That's just my play on security. Um, if you're going to put something out there with a keyboard, uh, make sure you lock it. Because <laughs> this is what can happen. Um, anyway, so it's a hybrid approach. 
Um, the reason we're doing this uh, this way is we had a four-year work plan to build out the infrastructure. Our council asked us to do it in two, so we said, fine, we're just going to do 350 intersections on Rogers, get it up and running, and as we build out, we'll take them off and put them on the Wi-Fi or fiber network. So the way, that's the project right there, significant construction project, about $400 million. Again, all, all of this is running east to west um, along the 403 corridor. Um, it connect, so this is higher order transit, whereas you'll see in a minute we have light rail transit that goes north-south. So this connects in with the, with the regional and local traffic. And all of these, this entire infrastructure is unmanned. There's no people running these stations all unmanned. Light rail transit, so um, interesting is the fiber network actually started on the Huron Ontario corridor, so this is some of our oldest fiber, happens to be a backbone. Um, so this is a pretty complex project for us. There's uh, and actually there's not 26 LRT stations anymore because we're not going all the way to Brampton. There's, I think there's 22 now. Uh, fiber crossings at all the different intersections, so we've got to replace of uh, backbone fiber and 30 some odd crossings while maintaining communication. So uh, it's going to be a challenging project, but we also understand that we're going to have to have integrated services on every platform because these platforms, while they'll be the light rail transit, will be connection points um, for other services such as Go, My Way, and Transit Way. So we're going to have to have next bus presence, we'll have to have security, cameras, um, and other uh, information that we'll need to get presence on those platforms from a technology perspective. So this is where you start to understand you know, is, is, is the a marketing term you hear out there, but this is about communications and connecting your key services. That's what this is about. So the planning process really is, is where um, we started about a year ago, um, is looking at it from a bigger picture. So what services really can we involve in this next design? So we know what the key drivers are, LRT, BRT, bands traffic management, but there's so many other things being built in the city at the same time. What's that bigger picture? And that's part of that planning process. <clears throat> hello, 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 that's better. I got it. <clears throat> Okay, we're back. Another sound problem. That's okay. okay. I just got to uh, get back to here. And um, how do I get that? Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to go back up here. So I guess what I was trying to say in the future state is the outdoor network will be three times the size of the indoor network. And you can see the number of sites, and if you recall, a site is a building. It's staying fairly static. The number of nodes is really what is tripling. And again, nodes are finding signs, intersections, but connecting things. That really is what's driving um, infrastructure building. So, um, so Cisco, this is just a, a quote from Cisco from IoT to Smart City. So the city of Mississauga has um, had the foresight to plan and build the necessary digital infrastructure in order to take advantage of the opportunities of the digital age. Um, so just, you know, we've heard this over and over again. We've heard from a lot of other cities that actually had some fiber infrastructure and gave it away to utility companies 10 years ago. And now they're coming back and they're getting all this pressure to connect and don't have that anymore. And, are, and are really the only option is to go with these pipelines um, or, or trying to build fiber, which is very tough these days because there's a lot of utilities in the ground. It's not that easy anymore. And the days of putting stuff on the pole are gone. The poles are full. Um, so. Um, so, so the fact we've been doing this for 20 years, and that's what they're saying we had the foresight, is we got in the ground early and we stuck with it, we continued to build. So without that, we would not be able to move as quickly as we can. So as more things uh, get connected, the city will be able to deliver more innovative applications that will set it apart from municipal competitors. Uh, they, so Cisco says, and, and I know Rick, is the sky's the limit. Um, Internet of Things is the foundation and digital is the future for the next generation of smart cities. I truly believe that, you know, that, that connecting services is that next um, level of delivery that's expected. And, and I think a lot of cities will struggle if they don't have that kind of them. <coughs> so district Wi-Fi. So one of the deliverables out of our IT master plan was the district Wi-Fi that I talked about. We had some short-term opportunities, which included a white paper, which told our story. 
And one of the things that um, we hadn't really done told the story, which I, you know, today I'm telling that story is what we got connected and what we're doing. And Cisco says, you guys actually have a pretty good story. So we did two things. We, we did a white paper on like what's our current state. And that actually got a lot of attention. And, and you know, we've been in Brazil and was invited by the government up to Brazil to actually tell a bit of what we did. Um, and then China as well. And actually we're going back to China this fall uh, because all the major cities across the world are getting together to talk about so we where we're going as far as uh, smart city technologies. And Mississauga is being recognized as being a, a leader there. The longer term opportunity is district Wi-Fi, and I'll talk a little bit about that. It really is this whole idea of changing city planning to include the implications of a connected and engaged community. Don't know if this video is going to work, but I'll give it a try. Hmm? Okay. So um, we did, I mentioned earlier, we, we uh, benchmarked other cities. So Barcelona, if you don't know this, is ground zero for smart cities. It's really the first city in the world to be considered a smart city. And they've actually, if you, if you take a look at some of what they've done, is they've actually met district Wi-Fi and connectivity affect how they've actually done city planning, how they've designed specific corridors and industries, and how they've brought things like educational institutions in, um, and, and, and evolved how the downtown is, has been built. So it's the first location of the city with full Wi-Fi coverage, um, and really, there's a lot of great examples there in Barcelona. The city of Chicago is actually one way to benchmarking even more closely around an open data portal using sensor-based technology. And we even have sensor-based technology that can recognize a gunshot, which is interesting. So if there's a gunshot, they understand where that happened and they can deploy quickly to that area. So some interesting applications. And what we're learning is, you know, different information is of significance for different areas and different services. So um, gunshot detection, uh, detection sensors are important there. Uh, so in France, they were looking at you know being more efficient, you know, so great economic development, real open data sharing, and innovation. Um, and then in Texas, they were looking at that whole remote monitor traffic control, traffic lights, street lights turn on when people are out. Um, so being more efficient and better public safety. And you see actually in Toronto, the mayor of Toronto was talking more about trying to affect the traffic patterns and, and re, re, um, re-evaluating on, on how they're working so they can advance traffic. So um, our proof of concept for district Wi-Fi, we've got a location um, to do the proof of concept, uh, which is basically an area that has high foot traffic, which has a bit of tourism, um, which has a lot of small business, and, and we pitched that with all the BIAs, and, and they're behind this and want to get involved. Once we uh, perfect um, that proof of concept in that location, then we have all the BIAs. So some of the ideas we're looking at as far as the smart and connected community is you know, efficiencies, things that save money. So that's where LED lighting is a great example. Save millions of dollars right away in, in electricity. Um, new revenue streams. Um, one of the opportunities here is, is to improve parking revenue. So in some of these areas, we're looking at parking apps that will help give people options or big transit. Can it still sound good? Yeah. Uh, citizen engagement. So this is having more interaction in in a space, and actually, the one example I'll give is uh, Open Bristol. Um, it's, uh, they had a real challenge because the the, the public, uh, the community wouldn't accept technology. They really did not trust it. And every time they tried to deploy technology in the community, it would be vandalized and stolen. And so they really struggled. And finally, they deployed the technology, and all this technology that they deployed it in the bar district and restaurant district was it projected a shadow down over the sidewalk, a light and you would dance in this, and then it would play it back to you. So you would step in it, dance, step out, and it played your shadow back to you. Well, they deployed 22 and 21 stayed. One got stolen, and the community fought to get the one back, and then protected these things. And that's actually how they gained trust in the community. And then they started to deploy other technologies, because now they had some acceptance. 
And so there's some learning behind um, getting local adoption and acceptance versus having a top-down, you know, trying to drive technology uh, from the top down is, is uh, you know, there's a real learning there. So this is just an example where you can use sensor technologies from these LED lights to monitor um, efficiencies or repairs, have those repairs or even the staff in the field actually take the picture and send it back to someone who said there's a repair, there's closing that loop around um, repairs and citizen uh, input and using sensor technology. This is a, um, a smart parking um, sensor that actually monitors parking spots and then shows where parking is available. So in some of these areas, parking comes at a premium. So if you want to know if there's a parking spot, it basically uses camera technology to show which spots are available on the map. This is this whole concept of engagement. The one piece we're looking at actually is, is this uh, the, the sign. So we're looking at digital signs being in close proximity to the transit. Uh, stop where you get up next bus, but then you would have uh, community messaging, um, advertising for local business, and actually have some, some two-way capability where you could have uh, either um, beacon type technology um, or Bluetooth technology so that you can interact with the signage. And if you've ever been in a major airport that's got wayfinding, they've got like a, basically a big screen that you can touch and you can say restaurants that will actually have to get there. Um, so that type of wayfinding could be part of these signs as well. The last piece was really interesting. This is sensor data. So these are environmental sensors. Um, in Chicago, they put these up. They basically wanted to gain trust. So not only did they collect the data, they publish it as open data. So they use the, the environmentals so that they can advertise things like, you know, it's a cool day, it's, it's a warm day, the air quality is good. Uh, but then they publish it as open data. So so if there's a local active transportation group or they were riding bikes or running, is they can use that same data um, and look at you know when's the best time of day to run through this corridor or, or you know, from a from a health perspective. So that was another way of gaining trust is by publishing the data they collect. <clears throat> so on the ground, this is what it looks like. We look at an area. This happens to be Port Credit. The reason this is a good location is. We have a federal port, we have a marina, we have an arena, we have a library. So we have some pretty critical infrastructure from a city services perspective. So we can do things like push the library into the outdoor space. We can connect now the university and college in Mississauga and create outdoor campuses here. We already have a partnership with Sheridan. Sheridan students can access their secure network in any facility in anywhere in the city where we have um, our Wi-Fi. Um, so now what this means is you can get a bit of an innovation incubator um, thing happening in some of these spaces. So we're looking at um, things like uh, smart parking, that free public Wi-Fi. But the Wi-Fi we see that's going to evolve and there's going to be um, a, a stronger link to uh, association or identity so that as you come into the space, um, it's more personalized. So that you're, you're, you know, so even if you use something like a third-party authentication, which is uh, something as simple as uh, Facebook, Gmail, or Twitter account, it, it would basically store your favorites. So if you if you like Starbucks and you like Baskin Robbins, um, and while you were here, you, you selected those things and logged in as your Gmail account, you would just save those as favorites. And so when you come back into that space, those locations could say those are Sean's favorites, and they could start to push you things like coupons or specials and and so it really creates a, um, a, a very simple way of engaging people when they come into the space. Um, beacon technology, sensors, cameras. So of course along the waterway, sensor technology and cameras are critical because you've got photos, you've got a fishing industry there. Um, so being able to see what the water's like before you come down is pretty important too. And so these are types of services that are valuable to citizens, to tourism, and to the businesses. So that is basically my overview. I know we didn't go through the videos, um, so I don't know if there are any questions. Um, yeah, we if they any questions, or we can even open them up. Uh, how we yeah, if you guys can type in your questions, uh, Sean can respond. One other question, I guess, uh, well, we have a question. The good thing is, the parking and all that, like you mentioned, which is good, but I think somebody was using the texting 
this camera will pick you up and read it or let it tell you things. So, so the way the parking is going is we're actually not looking at doing this parking spot as free. We're actually looking at creating um, a general sense of parking availability uh, and, and not that this spot's free. Um, and the reason we're doing that is even if you say that spot's free, the chance of being free 18 seconds from now is pretty low. Well because, because you know, a place like Port Credit, the spot's open and then someone jumps into it. But if you can see that generally 50% of the parking is taken, that you've got a pretty good chance of getting a parking spot. But if there's only one, so what we're trying to say is, you know, parking capacity is at 50% or 60% to give people a sense as opposed to what specific parking spots are there. Well, like in Florida, the Esquire I don't know if it's not the final goes up where I park in the smartphone page. So it will warn me and say, by the way, your parking thing is going to run out and I can tap right from my smartphone. So, so that's a great example of one of the things we might pilot in this space. So we have paid display today. One of the options is to go to something like that. And so that would be um, something you can pilot in the area with a higher level of service. Um, we haven't committed to that yet, although it's one that's of interest. Because basically if you park and you're in, you know, having your dinner and you, you, know, you know you're going to run out, okay. that would be nice to have. Yeah. That's a great example of, uh, of you know, enhanced service. Yeah. Yeah. The, the comment you can repeat the comments of these people. So yeah, the ability to extend parking is another great example of, of um, using technology to enhance a service. And I mean, it's, it's just a great way of, of creating a better customer experience. Nothing worse than having a loser restaurant and go pump some yeah. coins in, in a, a parking area. Yeah. You know, you get a big fine and you're running and you're a little late and you don't have enough change. So that problem goes away, right? Yeah. So that's, yeah, it's good source. I have a question. Sure. Um, how connected are you from a planning perspective with the rest of the people? So Brampton and Allen, which is what I'm so. Okay, great question. So, so, so how, how connected are we with uh, Brampton and, and, and Peel and Calvin um, from a planning perspective? So the public sector network um, is actually a formal body and the PSN is registered with the CRTC as a non-commercial telecommunications provider. And I'm on that board and there's representative from Brampton, Calvin and Peel and we manage the infrastructure as a team. And we've actually contracted out the administration of the PSN to a third party, and we've contracted out all of the maintenance of the PSN to a contractor. And we actually um, have subscribers. So we have subscribers from the schools and the hospitals that we actually, they pay for dark fiber. And the subscriber costs actually cover operating costs of the entire PSN. So it costs us nothing to manage the network. There's enough subscriber fees to pay for the ongoing maintenance. So the PSN, our fiber network, is fully inspected inch by inch, three times a year. Um, all our locate costs, which actually is quite significant, so all construction drives locate costs, is managed and paid for through um, subscriber revenue. And the administration of our contracts, so um, we have uh, Triple C as our contractor, which does all our construction work for 20 we have an emergency response of so the dump truck with this bucket up to it's the fiber down. And we get alerted right away and Triple C is uh, dispatched and they repair it. Um, and we have very high, our service levels uh, for voice and data are much higher than what you can buy. So very coordinated, so we do that. We also have something called VCOM, which is uh, the uh, public safety radio network. So I'm also a member of UCOM, as well as Brampton, Caledon, and Peel, and Peel Police. So it's a private P25 radio network for public safety, but all of our transit buses, all the fire trucks um, are also on that system, as well as all our outdoor workers. So we collaborate there as well. So we have one radio system for all of Peel, um, so we collaborate there. We also have shared services. So we. Um, we are through our one call centers, collaborate and, and we'll answer each other's. So not everyone knows what's a regional service and what's a city service. So the call centers share information. So if you call both 
garbage. If you call 311 and you get our call center, we don't manage waste management, but we'll answer your question. And so there is actually quite a bit of planning and cooperation amongst um, staff. Um, let's see. <coughs> So yeah, so there's various names. So I, I guess the way I look at it is if it's a business we're in that we manage, then it's going to be on our voice and data network. But if it's not a business that we're in, we manage, it's not going to be on, on infrastructure. We might have integration points, and so other agencies we'll integrate with because we're shared responsibilities. So like uh, PMS, uh, we'll have shared responsibilities, and again with the hospitals, where we'll transmit information from an, an incident, you know, much like what's happening today, um, to other agencies, hospitals, and, and other agencies. We will have those integration points, but if it's not our primary core function, then we will use our network. What's the timeline for the last two Question is for timeline for bus search. Yeah. So time. So the next bus at this point, the timeline. Next bus is being done along the transit way, which is the, along the Fourth Corridor. We're not doing it at all the bus stops around the city. So, so we're going to do the real time on an app. So right now we don't have full real time next bus, um, and it has to do with integration from two different systems in the transit system. And so we're doing a major upgrade. Um, so this fall, the two systems will be connected. Uh, because we do route planning in one, and the ABL happens in the other, and the routes are dynamic. Construction happens and changes the routes, and so then the real time has to be matched up. So there's, there's integration we're working on right now. Um, we could publish real time, but as route changes happen, it'll get out of sync. So we're waiting to get that connection. Even anyone that says they have real time hit any city, if 95% of the best you're going to get because there's constant changes in the system. But yeah. We will have real-time signage in key locations. Uh, we'll go to business centers and actually give them a GTFS feed, an open data feed, so they can display it in their lobbies, so they can show it in their lobby, so that we don't have to build transit um, bus stops inside their buildings. Um, but the mobile app will be the other thing, so you'll be able to get this in your location right now, next bus information. It's the most efficient way. What about Wi-Fi? Right now, uh, a lot of, you know, effort is in there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we have Wi-Fi in every city facility, so all public libraries, community centers, marinas, golf courses, um, the transit terminals, every station along the BRT or the transit way has uh, Wi-Fi. Um, district Wi-Fi will be the expansion, so we'll start to take that into the built form where we have lots of concentration of small business and lots of foot traffic. Um, and then we're looking at other broadband type technologies as well, um, which might be more so for our own operations. Uh, but um, so our, our footprint on, on, on free public Wi-Fi is quite large now. Um, and again, we have that partnership with Sharon. No, we uh, we were no, not. No, so that's a no, no, commercial no, no. area. Yeah. And actually, one of the things we're looking at is um, and so our proof of concept. And we're actually gonna after the proof of concept, we're gonna go into market and look for partners, public partnership. And we want to encourage other service providers to provide that kind of connectivity in some of those commercial spaces. Uh, we don't want actually we don't want to be in the business of providing those services right. like right, their business, uh, but we want to be able to encourage them and if anything have some some contextual connectivity so that if we can access certain services in our space, maybe we can advertise those services in the commercial space too. Uh, so library might be an example where 
and I hate to use Starbucks all the time, but if you go into Starbucks, it would be nice if you get access to the, um, the secure library experience. Um, and so that would be good. Yes, Tim Hortons would be fine too. <laughs> <laughs> Is it secure? Secure in what way? That's a, that's a pretty big question. You use Wi-Fi and secure in the same So here's, here's, here's my take on um, people, process, and technology. Okay, so it all depends on all those three things. But wired versus wireless, wireless is more secure than wired. That's my opinion. So, <laughs> Thanks for joining the session. Just wanted to ask you, 20 years ago, this wasn't really a value. And you probably have your board side. Somebody had a question. How accepted by the government to say, go ahead, that is a great deal. You might want to repeat that question. So, so 20 years ago, how accepted um, was, was our government leadership? To, to actually build fiber, um, it actually was almost necessary because if you think back 20 years, there wasn't a lot of infrastructure in Mississauga anyway. So, so if, if we had gone to another service provider, they would have been doing construction. As a matter of fact, you don't have to go too far north of here to communities where it's the same thing. There's houses that just can't get connectivity, and, and the answer is they have to build fiber. And 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 if you talk to any um, commercial provider. They're all busy building fiber right now. They're crazy. And so at the time we actually didn't have many options. Um, but once we got it in place, we could demonstrate those cost savings. And actually, we were one of the first uh, cities in Canada to implement the uh, voice over IP. And we did an RFP and Cisco won the RFP. And when we did that, we were able to, to do that whole concept of rationalizing our trunk lines and our landlines to all our facilities. And, and in one year, dropped our, our um, lease lines by $750,000. Think about that just as a one-year payback. Um, so that really wasn't a planning moment. It's to show, hey, this fiber has value. Yeah, Jeff. Metro so MetroLink actually owns that. So so there's uh, so they own the infrastructure. The infrastructure is in a community. So you can reload your, your cards in our community yeah. centers. That's done over at a, a cyber network. Yeah. So it's, the plan is to expand it to all. We will make a hundred percent conversion to Presto. That's not the plan. That's MetroLink's vision. We um, we're part of that vision and a regional type of transit network. I think ultimately what MetroLink is thinking is. And there's some benefit. I mean, you should, it should be cost effective and to go across all those transit systems. It wasn't fair. Okay. Why is it? I'm not in charge of transit. No, no, I did. I'm in charge of what's the data transit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. So you know, there's a whole conversation. Uh, so I actually was at a con was at a conference uh, in Orlando not too long ago, and uh, the keynote was Steve Wozniak. And they asked him a question, just that same question, and, they, and, and artificial um, intelligence. And his opinion was that, that artificial intelligence would not be achieved. Um, and it was interesting to hear his theory. And, 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 and all I would say is, I think that artificial intelligence type scenarios will be the future. And the, um, and again, a simple example. Um, we design a left, left turn signal to advance four cars based on traffic patterns. But you've got a cell phone, we can see it there, and you know, wouldn't it be nice to say, let's, there's a fifth guy, we can see him, add two seconds to the turn signal. And so to me, that's, that's, a, that's an intelligent response that could be automated um, based on a real-time scenario, not based on patterns over the last 10 years. The traffic has actually been designed based on the only patterns. So to me, 
I'll say artificial intelligence that will make decisions, but I think it's not quite artificial intelligence. I think it is based on parameters. Uh, that are, yeah, machine type learning, but also sensing. So I sensor there, you're the fifth car, we're going to let you go through. Or, hey, this feels like rush hour, let's implement rush hour um, programs. Um, so I think, and what you'll see is, and actually one of, one of the worries out there, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to the um, autonomous vehicle conversation, because we have a traffic, uh, a transit master plan that we're working on here at the city. And there's this whole thought process that by 2040, autonomous vehicles you know, will be very much in place. Uh, and this is going to put pressure on the taxi industry, the trucking industry. And my only, my concern, you know, as someone who could help drive some of that innovation, is it displacing a workforce. And I'm not sure in you know, a lot of countries, you know, first world countries like ours, as we do more and more automation where trains and trucks and taxis and buses and all these things can run on their own, what happens to that workforce? And I think that we have to really, actually, when I look at the TTC and the challenges they have around you know, getting new street cars, I think we should be looking at our problems and need to solve it here in some way and create, create an economy to build those cars ourselves because we're, we're offshoring a lot of that stuff and it's not getting delivered. And I think if we don't create work here for these people um, who are in those jobs that could be displaced through technology, we're going to create a real problem for ourselves in the long run. So I think as we look at a smart city, part of being smart is making sure that everyone has a place, everyone has a job, and um, not offshoring and automating those things to the point where you create a bigger gap between the, the engineers that are inventing the technology and the people who used to do the work. Any other questions? I don't see no. No. We didn't see it. If there are no other questions, uh, I can just grab it. Like, no. So if there are no other questions, uh, we're going to bring closure. But I first of all would like to uh, thank Sean for a very informative uh, presentation. And uh, the fact that the one of the videos in run, don't worry about it. We will actually get the copy, right? and would we'll link it uh, to the presentation so that when you see uh, that any audio that you might have missed will in fact be in there. It meant all the way through to the webinar, but it will certainly get it captured here, so we will have that. Yeah. And uh, you will have that, so if anything you missed will be there. Uh, so my apologies for that, but um, bad things can happen now and then, and hopefully we can get on top of that. The more important thing is that I thought it was very helpful uh, very informative presentation, so we really know a lot of them. Thank you very much for all taking your time out of your busy and summer schedule um, to attend this, and we will certainly make a copy of the journey. So thanks very much. Have a wonderful evening, gentlemen. You're driving, drive safe. Have a wonderful summer. Talk to you soon. See you later. Thanks.